Professor of Evidence Science David Shum speaks of joining the dots of evidence. He says where we are weighing up different hypotheses, the one most likely to be true is the one that joins the greatest number of dots into a coherent narrative. So let's look at the dots of evidence relating to Marlowe in 1593 and how they stack up for the three different hypotheses of what might have happened in Deptford, brawl, assassination or escape. Here are the dots of evidence already discussed, and let's bring in some more. First, Queen's Coroner Danby acted alone. He was involved because the killing happened within the verge, that is, within twelve miles of the monarch's person. Though the distance from Nonsuch Palace to Deptford was in fact sixteen miles, the inquest document repeats the phrase, within the verge, four times. But even for a killing within the verge, the county coroner would usually also be present. Peter Ferry has argued Marlowe's inquest may have been legally void because of the absence of a county coroner. Then we have Fraser's pardon from the Queen, which was exceptionally rapid. Despite apparently killing a man who was at that time England's premier playwright, Fraser was out of prison in a month. In cases of killing in self-defence like Fraser's, three or four months was more common. We have the fact that Fraser goes straight back into Thomas Walsingham's service the day after his release, and remains in the service of the Walsinghams for the rest of his life. Once King James is on the throne, he is rewarded with land and property in the form of leases in reversion. Another evidential dot relevant to the escape theory is that members of the Privy Council had interceded on Marlowe's behalf before. In 1587, five of them wrote a letter insisting that Cambridge University award Marlowe's MA, despite the fact there were rumours he intended to go to the Catholic seminary at Ream. They stated he had done Her Majesty good service in matters touching the benefit of his country and deserved to be rewarded for his faithful dealing. Sixteen months before the Deptford incident, in January 1592, Marlowe was betrayed by Richard Baines and arrested in Flushing for the crime of counterfeiting. This was petty treason, but Marlowe appears to have been let off this potentially capital offence by Lord Treasurer Burley. Riggs argues that the counterfeiting operation was an intelligence services attempt to infiltrate the network of Catholic conspirator Sir William Stanley. The fact that Marlowe wasn't apparently imprisoned or prosecuted suggests he had support at the very highest levels of government and can be taken as another example of intervention on Marlowe's behalf. The location in Deptford is another evidential dot. Mrs Bull's house was not a tavern, as is often wrongly assumed. Eleanor Bull had courtly connections, being cousin to chief gentlewoman of the Privy Chamber and Queen's favourite, Blanche Parry, who was in turn a cousin of Lord Treasurer Burley, who since the death of Thomas Walsingham's cousin Sir Francis had been running the government's intelligence operations. So here are some key dots of evidence relating to Marlowe in Deptford. Let's see the extent to which they can be joined to support the escape hypothesis. Three professional liars would be very useful for any cover-up, and the fact that two of them were connected like Marlowe to the intelligence services works too. Polly's being in the service of the Queen can be connected if Marlowe's escape was instigated or supported by members of the Privy Council, and the timing would not be coincidental. The accusations against Marlowe in spring 1593 were becoming so significant that they could no longer be sidestepped and would almost certainly have necessitated his imprisonment and prosecution. There is reason to believe that, like the complaints against him in Cambridge 16 years earlier, these accusations resulted from work he was doing on the government's behalf, so it would not be unreasonable if his powerful employers moved to disappear him. Any plan of this nature would necessarily be somewhat elaborate to have the best chance of succeeding. That Marlowe's friend Thomas Walsingham is the silent connection between everyone present at Deptford supports the idea of his escape, as does the fact that there is no one who can be shown to really benefit from his death, a death which may well have happened anyway as a result of official prosecution had the convenient knife fight not occurred. Then there's the delay of Polly's important letters. 
The calendar of Scottish papers states that Poley knew the best ways to pass into Scotland. And Thomas Kidd told Lord Keeper Puckering that Marlowe would persuade men of quality to go unto the King of Scots, whither I hear Royden is gone, and where, if he had lived, he told me when I saw him last, he meant to be. Which is not to say that Marlowe went to Scotland with Poley, but Poley's involvement in Marlowe's escape, rather than his murder, would explain why the delivery of those letters was delayed. It allows us to join this particular dot into the narrative in a coherent way. In fact, the delayed delivery of those letters supports only the escape hypothesis. Neither of the other narratives can account for it. The fact that Danby acted alone is another dot that can be joined under this hypothesis. As can Freiser, remaining in the service of Marlowe's friend. His rapid pardon by the Queen supports an escape arranged at the highest level. As does the fact that Eleanor Bull had court connections. The fact that members of the Privy Council had intervened to help Marlowe on a previous occasion, and that Lord Burley appears to have let him off a capital charge of coining only sixteen months earlier, also add weight to the evidence which supports the escape narrative. Indeed, the only piece of evidence weighing against this hypothesis, the one dot that cannot be joined, is the inquest document. But as we've seen from the track record of the witnesses, this is not necessarily a document that can be trusted. You can see, then, that the idea that the Deptford incident was a cover-up for Marlowe's escape is actually very well supported by the evidence we have. In comparison, the notion of a brawl, the official version, is largely contradicted by the same evidence. I've greyed out the evidence that isn't relevant to this hypothesis. The assassination theory joins a few more of the dots, though the fact that Thomas Walsingham is Marlowe's friend means that Fryser's remaining in Walsingham's service counts against the theory. But the hypothesis best supported by the evidence is undoubtedly Marlowe's escape. And we can see the comparison very clearly if we bring all three together. Marlowe's escape, which is generally dismissed out of hand, joins considerably more dots of evidence than the two competing theories that orthodox scholars generally consider to be valid. And you have to ask yourself, if you were Marlowe, if you had potentially capital charges levelled against you and it didn't look like you'd get off this time, you'd have motive. And if you had your intelligence service contacts, including your patron, to help you, means. And if you were out on bail, having the opportunity to fake a death, thereby escaping real death, would you really sit around waiting for the axe to fall? People fake their death now for reasons as small as credit card bills or to escape unhappy marriages, and it was a lot easier 400 years ago before photographs, proper passports, cash point cards, the internet, DNA fingerprinting and the like. Very few people in Deptford, if any, would know what Marlowe looked like, barring the three witnesses whose chief shared talent was deceit. Identifying the body as Marlowe's, these gentlemen would be very likely to be believed by the jury of yeomen, who were not only their social inferiors in this very hierarchical society, but would have no reason to doubt them. A substitute body could easily be that of John Penry, executed the day before, less than three miles away at St Thomas of Watering. Penry's corpse, never accounted for, and its whereabouts not divulged to his family, would be the property of the Queen's coroner, Danby, the man who conducted Marlowe's inquest. So did Marlowe die in 1593? The evidence suggests we should doubt it. <laughs>